like Vasquez said in Aliens, let's rock. If you're new to the tribe, Rad is across the table, Rich is behind the mix. My name is Yanni Bormeister and we are Unity Gym, experts at turning driven people into athletes. This episode is brought to you by the Unify Movement System, the online program that balances strength, flexibility and fitness in an efficient 60 minute workout so you can unleash your inner athlete. Get daily coaching by us, plus our epic gym and home UMS programs, extensive exercise library, private coaching group, and weekly group coaching calls. As a valued listener, use the link in the description to get your first month free. Before we get started, big warm welcome. If you're watching on the Unity Gym YouTube channel, remember to hit that like button. The more likes we get, the more legends like yourself get to see and hear this content. And always, as always, subscribe if you like what you see. I'm excited to announce that joining us today, we have Phil White Physio, uh, Phil White from ADPT Physio. Yeah, and if you didn't know, his name's not actually Phil White Physio, it's Phil White, uh, but he is a physio and Phil started work in the fitness industry Back in 2012, he was first as a remedial massage therapist. That's where we met him. And then he went on to study exercise sports science uh, and a doctor of physiotherapy, a postgraduate degree. Now he runs ADPT Physio, where they specialize in delivering the athlete rehab experience to everyone. And he is good. Phil's been a massage therapist to the GWS Giants AFL team here in Australia to Olympians, Paralympians, and a number of other professional athletes. Good to have you on the show today, Phil. Yeah, stoked to be here. The yeah. podcasts are always my favorite part of the day. So mm. yeah, just love talking about this sort of stuff. And yeah, for people who have questions, keep them coming. Cause yeah. yeah, love this. And I just have to say, uh, one day I aspire to have somebody introduce me on the podcast the way that we introduce Phil, but you know, we'll, <laughs> we, one, one can only dream. <laughs> yeah, I'll, get, I'll get you next time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This episode is brought to you by Helen Madge. Um, Helen has asked the question, if doing cardio and strength, should you always do strength first or does it depend on your goals? Example, if it is to actually run a marathon, should cardio? come first and Helen is a member of the UMS online coaching group so uh, why don't we throw this one over to Can I start? yeah Phil nice. yeah love that <laughs> uh, yeah I got really excited when I saw this question because it's been a, a passion point for me because uh, I've always been sort of on the team sports cardio side of things and coming to the gym was a really wonderful experience for me getting past holiday injuries that I'd um, had during my um, 11 years of playing international level ultimate frisbee that really kind of ended my frisbee career and i just thought i'd take a season off try doing a bit of strength training um really improve my injuries but then kind of went down the rabbit hole and got sort of got stuck there for a while but more recently i sort of got back into team sports and, and back into triathlon so since going from like into the gym with the unity guys and doing some powerlifting, now i've started to um yeah train for a half iron man so that's um, about as cardio as you can get and so it's been really kind of fun and interesting challenge of trying to figure out how to optimize both developing strength maintaining strength maintaining injury kind of prevention strength while also really trying to up my cardio so this is something that i've been kind of getting a bit obsessed about and and going into the, the science behind it so yeah, really excited for this one. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and we've all and and before you dive into the science, we've all got a bit of a personal um, uh, view on this because Rad has gone very deep into martial arts, and I've gone very deep into boxing. And I think the the same what we're going to talk about today could essentially be argued for any sport that you want to specialize in. You know, the way that you prioritize uh, your training, the way that you structure your training split. You know, because we've had um, high level jujitsu athletes come to Unity Gym and, uh, and, 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 you know, when you start to um, work with people that are very specific about wanting to perform in a certain sport, you, you do have to sort of change the training split because the two aren't, aren't always sort of um, uh, done in unison. You know, you, mm. one will affect the other. And so, mm. you know, what we talk about today doesn't necessarily have to be applied to someone who wants to do a triathlon or that wants to run a marathon. It can kind of be applied to anyone who wants to compete high level at a sport, to, unless, you know, the sport is weightlifting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think if you don't overthink it and you just want to be a bit fit, um, like you want to be pretty fit and you'll be strong and flexible, just follow the Unity program as is and you'll get a great result. Um, but certainly I love that you're hitting on something really good here, Helen, with um, talking about asking about the goals. Did you want to jump in before I... Very quickly, yeah, because please. I love what you've said there and it is a little bit of a shameful plug, but I just want to <laughs> I, I want to point out just to anybody that doesn't know before Phil goes deep into, into his belief on this and the science behind it, 
The reason why at Unity Gym, we do a 10 minute mobility warm up, then 30 minutes of um, primary workout focusing on strength and flexibility, finishing with a cardio circuit is because we want a balance, but a balance means that we want to make people as strong as possible, as safely as possible. And what we've found is that if you try to do that same strength training session after you've done a high intensity interval training session, there is no chance in hell that you're going to lift as much weight, which means it will affect your strength potential. Whereas if you do a high intensity interval training session after you've done strength training, you might be neurologically fatigued, but you can still flog yourself cardiovascular wise and get a good response right. with cardio. And it's more complementary. Yeah. So just just wanted to say that really yeah. and and the the ums program um is about creating a foundation a foundation of strength flexibility and fitness that you can deploy into any sport really effectively and you know it it is uh it, it we try not to specialize in anything because we want people to be able to come through the program who are ready to go and take on the world afterwards, you yeah. know? Uh, and, and, and But that doesn't mean that the UMS is gonna make you the best soccer player or the best marathon runner. At some point you will have to do specific training it, for the sport. It, it won't even do. come close. If yeah. you were to perform, if you did the UMS and then went and did a triathlon against, or a half triathlon against somebody that was training for a half triathlon, you wouldn't compete against them. But you would most likely be able to do a half triathlon and also play a full, ultimate frisbee game and fare pretty well in both without yeah. getting annihilated but just anyway. tough iron man just to <laughs> yeah. the, uh, pull you up on the terminology there but yeah all right Phil, let's uh let's, let's hear so, your so yeah thought. first up helen i'm stoked that you've kind of um got the right answer off the bat which is yes it will definitely depend on your goals if you're looking for optimal performance so um that's yeah you've, you've clearly been paying attention and, and definitely um the goals are going to be really important. That's going to bring us up to say the yeah, it depends, which is the the classic answer to most questions when it comes to human body and performance. So um, yes, it's going to depend on your goals. But the other thing I want to just point out quickly is that it might not always be the same for all times of the year. So your goals might change um, throughout the year, or you might have one big goal that means that you have a certain event that you're coming up for um, at a certain time of year. And that means that um, to optimally get to that period, you might have periods where you're going through a real strength phase, similar to athletes when they do a kind of classic preseason before their team sports, and they'll they'll put um, kind of strength as the overriding um, priority, and therefore probably you know if they're doing two training sessions at once, they'll do the the strength, and then um, that will change as they get closer to the event. So I just wanted to point out that with all of this, it's, it's always going to be a like if you really want to take it to the most extreme sort of optimal um, air, like. Um, depth of this then it can also then depend um, within a year within that sport and that's where periodization um, training is um, yeah the secret sauce to to successful uh, athletic development but to talk about a bit about the um, why you'd be considering changing this up is that basically yeah you do get this with the technical term is concurrent training so where you're trying to get two different sort of fairly separate <coughs> adaptations um, and there definitely is interference at play. And so interference is basically like when we think about when we want to get stronger or fitter, we're going to stress our body in a certain way. And then that stress plus rest and recovery will equal an adaptation if that stress is within, you know, sensible, <laughs> challenging bounds, but not, um, you know, not totally overloading. Um, and then that adaptation will happen if there is recovery and if there is adequate energy and, and fuel to to for the body to then u utilize and either put down more uh, muscle fibers, um, change the fiber type or um, to lay down like the cardiorespiratory changes, like your um, mitochondrial density for fitness um, or changing the way that you're like how much blood your um, heart can pump with each um, pump. So there's kind of all these different adaptations that will happen specifically to the type of training you give it. And if you go really hard on um, both of these stimuluses at once, then you're basically going to not al like allow full development of um, those changes. So just to try and make that clear. So if your um, body's, you've done all this hard uh, strength training and then you go straight into doing some really hard cardio, like endurance cardio, then your body's kind of getting this like mixed signal. And also you won't have that chance, like that rest and recovery to um, lay down those uh that expensive sort of new muscle fiber um and yeah you kind of get that like effect of you start to overtrain rather than get these um these optimal changes Does that make sense so yeah yeah absolutely there. absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah and it's and sorry i well, I, I just want to say um you know 
it's it's really important that people take into consideration like the macro big picture life journey you know when when they're d deciding how they want to train and all this sort of stuff because i'm a huge proponent of maintaining the ability to go for a run and and the ability to do certain um to do certain things good cardiovascular fitness both on an aerobic and an anaerobic uh level but the 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 thing that people don't often take into consideration until it's too late is the importance of the maintenance of strength and 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 the reason why I'm saying this is because it's really, really nice to fantasize about doing a, a marathon or a triathlon or this or that. But when you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, you have to take into a, a, a consideration what is going to be affected if you do that. And is it is it worth it yeah. in the end? You know, because you can be really fit and healthy and not run a marathon, you know. Mm. Because running a marathon at the age of 40, like I see this a lot and I've had a lot of clients do this where they decide I need a radical intervention to get myself back into shape and they choose and it's great. You know, we're, we're really big proponents of choosing something that you can motivate yourself to do and have a, a means to demonstrate it. But at 50 years old to train for a marathon, you're going to lose a lot of muscle. Like there's just very little way of avoiding that. You know, you have to do an immense amount of cardiovascular training. And if you're not dieting really well, if you're not um, uh, doing a bit of strength training to try and hold on to your muscle tissue, you're going to lose a fair bit of muscle tissue um, to get your body prepared to be able to run that distance. You just, it's just not efficient to carry a lot of muscle Yeah, but well, you point out there that if you continue doing strength training throughout marathon training, which we'll get to in a second, like that can definitely help maintain a yeah. lot of muscle there, but we'll get to Yeah, and that's, that's, issues. that's, but it takes time. But then the, on the flip side, unfortunately, do, like, um, you are, you know, you're not, you're not going to be an elite level marathon runner if you're doing a lot of strength training. You just, it, the two just interfere with each other. So you, you got to kind of say, okay, am I doing this because I would just like to have that achievement and milestone ticked off? And if that, then that's the case. Don't try to become a professional mar at elite level marathon runner, because that's going to prop that, that could potentially have a negative impact on your overall health long-term, uh, do it from a recreational standpoint and go, okay, my goal is to get this done, feel really great about myself doing it, but come out of it healthy at the end, you know, because the, you, you know, you can like, if you're like me, you get very, very, um, enthusiastic and passionate about com competition and competing. And I've just seen this a lot where I've had people come and work with me afterwards to try to regain their health after going down the rabbit hole of like a really elite level, um, uh, sort of, um, event like that. And it's very hard to do so after the age of sort of 50 or 60 years old. You well, know? I actually really enjoyed the chat that we had with Aaron the other day where um, when we were training out there, it wasn't what we did on the podcast in here, but we did um, we did a, like a moving podcast, I guess, where we were all just doing a little bit of movement out there and chatting. And he was talking about the idea of, you know, after the age of 35, really, if you don't touch it once a week as in just give it a little bit of attention you, you lose it mm. and it it's not really like that in our experience before the age of 35 like i remember being 30 and the things that i would do with kung fu like acrobatic type movements i wouldn't do them for six months and then i'd just have a little go and i could play around with it and when i started trying to do that after the age of 35 i, I just couldn't even jump anymore like yeah. i was so surprised my my brain knew how to do these acrobatic movements but i couldn't jump off the ground I, because I hadn't done it for so long. Yeah. And so the idea that you would not have, like if you're in your forties or fifties, that you haven't done something for so long and that you're just going to come back and do something at that higher level, um, is a flawed approach, I think. And then if we tie it in to Helen's question, should cardio or should strength comes first? Well, it depends on what you want to achieve, but just make sure that those goals as you get older are, are in alignment with not just what you want to achieve in two or three months, but where do you want to be in the next couple of years? Where do you want to be for the rest of your life? Because all of these decisions yeah, with the ways that you impact your training, that they are, they, they do start to have a, a bigger effect on the quality of your life, you know, as we get a little bit older. Yeah. yeah. Which Phil hasn't enjoyed. Uh, <laughs> Um, the feeling of yet because you're still so how 35. old? 30, 30, I'm 31. 31. Yep. Yeah. 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 Just wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, that's that's all I would sort of. Um, um, well, what's Phil got to say? I can see him. Yeah. yeah so basically, now looking at like with 
what goes first and why. So for me at the moment, I'm doing, um, as I said, all this training for the half Ironman, which is pretty solid endurance stuff. So if I was to try and fit two sessions within a day, I'm going to prioritize like if I was to do, remember how um, in the, in other podcasts we've talked to Tony Chaji about having that like idea of you want to have hard days and easy days, hard days and yeah. easy days. Mm-hmm. And so we want to think that like when are we having rest, we want to have really good quality rest and recovery. And that recover, so that might mean that I'll do uh, very low intensity like um, conversational. Like I can still have a conversation while I'm running or or on my bike, really low level stuff on the on the easy days. And then when I'm doing harder training, I'll do um, like a hard like sprint or interval sort of um, session or hard threshold work, which is basically like running at race pace um, on those hard days. Now, I'd, with then trying to add a strength into it, you wouldn't want to do that before you're then doing your hard stuff. So basically it's like you're trying to bank all your fatigue in, in one go and then having like a good amount of chance to properly recover because it just gets, if you start trying to do all of it at once all the time, you just get into this kind of gray zone of um, because you're no longer fresh, you can't push yourself and you can't get to that sort of high level um, to then keep adapting and get getting stronger now it does become really hard there where if you're trying to do hard interval stuff and then you're trying to do hard strength work it's just not going to happen so that's where that kind of longer term periodization uh comes into it and so um when i'm doing my strength word up work after a, a harder uh, cardio session it's nowhere near as high intensity as what i would um otherwise have, nowhere near as high a load as i would have done yeah. um in the gym a lot of it's been body weight single leg sort of stuff um just building up sort of strength endurance so you just really can't kind of match them together and it's since been getting back into the gym i've started doing just like solid strength training um by itself standalone because i still want to like maintain that strength because when you can maintain strength the reason why it does improve your cardio performance is because if you're if you could say my um uh arbitrary numbers here if every step i take when i'm running um is you know 20 kilos of uh, sorry 60 kilos of force um if i'm if my one rm on my single leg um you know same muscle same arbitrary thing is uh you know 120 versus 100 kilos that's a much lower percentage of um each contraction so being stronger does help you because you can then um basically become fatigue resistant and and keep the uh, system strong so you're not going to injure yourself so chucking that strength work is important but yeah you just want to think about interference and how can i separate my hard sessions as much as possible so you get a chance to adequately recover so and what do you my like If we take away all of the science and all of the research and if we really simplify it down, for me, back when I did martial arts, there's something that stuck with me um, right through my training, which was I was always taught whatever you you want to get better at, do that first. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, when it comes to martial arts, that is uh, skill work. So work that requires actually trying to develop a skill, timing, movement before you do the really fatiguing um, endurance type work that comes in martial arts. Because if you do martial arts and you do, I did Kung Fu, if you do a really hard workout, they're really endurance based workouts. They're really, they're quite intense, they're quite long. And by the end of it, you're just so um, glycogen depleted and it's really, really hard to, you know, even- Neurologically fatigued as well. And then to try to then, for like in martial arts that a lot of this, at least in Kung Fu, some of the skill work is acrobatic type work. If I tried to do that, in that state, there's just no chance. Mm -hmm. So you do the thing that you really want to see improvement in first, and then you move on to it. Now, if then you move on to- Which is usually the more complex- Yeah, that's right. Of the movements. But so then if you you look at the idea of why would you want to do cardio before strength, I would, my personal opinion is you'd want to have a really good reason as to why cardio is that much more important to you to either building or maintaining strength. And I'm not saying that it, it, it shouldn't be. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, in my opinion, I think you should have a very, very solid reason as to why that would be. Because I still do believe that you can perform quite well doing cardio as your secondary part to strength training. Whereas yeah. we've all just spoken about our experience with you just cannot do a really good strength training session if you've just done a, a, a decent cardio session first. Now quickly, just very quickly, cause I want to try and get this into the discussion. There was a post either in our UMS online coaching or Movement Mastermind about a, a couple of weeks ago from someone who was- I'm pretty sure it was from- um, Dropping a, um, a new research study and suggesting that cardio before resistance training enhances 
Well, it used the nice. words might enhance, might, might increase strength potential or something. If you, if you do it. 20 minutes of jogging before strength training, it might increase. Can you, um, Richie, can you have a scour of the, the, was it in the coaching group? Yeah, no, it was in the movement mastermind In group. the movement mastermind. Um, can you have a scour for that? Have, yeah. a, have a look through and see if we could bring that up. And what are your up. thoughts on that, Yanni? What did you, what did you well, want to Well, I say? wanted to see, look, the, 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 like I, I, everything that I've ever learned, and that's through the influence of other people, uh, other experts, whether they be bodybuilders or professional powerlifters or weightlifters. I've done weightlifting, mm. uh, you In know, Olympic weightlifting yep. um, uh, workshops and things like that. Uh, it's always the same that, you know, if you go and do a belt yourself in cardio, you're going to fatigue the central nervous system and the central nervous system is required to be fresh yeah. for weightlifting. And so you're not going to be able to lift as much weight, which is one of the key components of the development of strength and or hypertrophy, yeah. you know? Uh, so but it can also I think like, sorry, just, I think the, this is a trap that so many people fall into. And it's something that I've been seeing a lot with patients as well with who are coming in because they get injuries. Like, and it's something that I've really had a, a huge turnaround in my own in thinking since I've started doing this half Ironman training. And that is that like people really undervalue low intensity cardio. Mm. They always think like, if I need, if I want to get fitter or if I want to lose weight, then I have to be belting myself doing either threshold. So that race pace or above like mm -hmm. with interval work to get any effective, um, uh, yeah, weight loss or cardio increases, but there's just so much benefit um, to your cardiovascular system by doing that really low intensity stuff. And what's really great about it is it then also won't leave you neurologically fatigued, so it won't interfere quite as much, um, and it will it'll build up like uh, impact tolerance and 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 strength around your joints if you do it really well. Um, and if you can fit more of that in at a low intensity and, and not have so much carryover. And so with that, like, and with maybe this program about training, bef doing cardio before weights, like I, there is no chance that that would have been high intensity cardio before <laughs> unless yeah, it was right. for two and a half minutes maybe. Yeah, that's right. Like it's, yeah. yeah. And you know what else, Phil? Um, you know, my personal experience um, in talking about low intensity cardio. So I've recently made a change. I used to ride an electric scooter to work and I've recently got rid of that because bloody cops pulled me over and told me I couldn't ride it. Um, and so I'm now wa walking to work every day and it's about a, it's about a 15 minute fast paced walk. Solid hill. But I intentionally walk up the steep hill. So you can, there's yeah. the fork in the road yeah, no, where I can either go up Blues road. Point Road oh, or I can yep. go up. And so it's, it's a good hill that's probably about maybe 200 to 300 meters long. And by the time I get to the top of that, I'm dripping with sweat. I'm out of, well, not out of breath, but I'm, my heart rate is elevated. My breathing rate is uh, faster. And I am fitter now from just doing that daily than oh, I was yeah. when I was riding my yeah. scooter to work. And that it's not even close to high intensity. Like I get to work and I could immediately go into a full workout from it. Yeah. Um, so it, it really does yeah. help. And so a, a kind of way of, um, as I said before, like conversational pace while you're doing it, being able to um, like breathe through your nose is a good one of keeping you at a low enough intensity because it's like yeah, really yeah. uncomfortable if you start doing that. Um, and the, so this is about a few times and this is about like um, different aerobic thresholds. And basically, as you start to go into those higher aerobic thresholds, then you start to use glycogen as a fuel source, and you start to get that higher intensity stuff, which will probably be a bit more interfering. Um, and another way of um, being able to find these thresholds as well is when you're um, in, like your first threshold is basically where you start to breathe deeper but not faster and that second threshold is basically where you start to um, breathe faster as well so if you can tr um, be doing the cardio in between that level of um, you're breathing deeper but you're not breathing faster then you're probably in that sort of sweet spot of like it's going to be great for your cardiovascular health it's going to be good for um, load tolerance throughout your whole body but it won't be interfering with your training so if you did want to do um, either that kind of before like a bit of cardio before you trained then keep it at that intensity and not for a huge duration but on your as a recovery it's also quite a nice way of of you know staying fit but not interfering with your strength as long as you're fueling appropriately <laughs> so first and foremost i just want to uh, mention make a mention because it's really important um I, f I found the post and uh unfortunately i can't i can't read it because yeah, uh nice. I, i'm not a subscriber to the new york times but it's a, there's a very big difference and I'm just trying to find, I may have found the study. I have, I've found the study so I can actually have a look at it. Um, when you read an article 
in a newspaper, you're, you're, you're relying on the interpretation of an, uh, an author, of, mm -hmm. a, uh, yeah. of a journalist, which is very, <laughs> very... And keep in mind, uh, people who are writing for papers are often trying to get something that people will click on. Exactly, so they might, exactly. Yeah, they want, yeah, they want clickbait. And they, so first and foremost, usually you're not reading an interpretation from a sports scientist. You're reading an interpretation of a sports science journal by a journalist yep. and uh and so it's it's very they, they will play with words yep. they will do should things that will anecdotally and, exa you know, exactly exactly yeah exactly at, at most it should probably trigger your um your desire to want to look further into it but yep. it shouldn't should certainly not be something that you should read it's and go oh wow this is something to yeah take and so this is talking about 20 minutes of cycling may improve the, and this is really interesting because the the article the article in the new york times so, says cycling or running and they've used a picture of a run but when i look through the article journal here it is very specifically cycling yeah which well, is which is a you know like we, they just change little things to suit uh their you know their their, their paper or whatever so but that's I, that's I, a very i think we should watch out going down the rabbit hole with this i think yeah. i think we should really just leave the idea on that that when you read an article just be aware that it is exactly what we've but, just but this described. is this is this is really important because they're saying here high intensity leg cycling alters the molecular response to resistance exercise in the arm muscles so they're talking about you know um stimulating um, lower extremity to train upper extremity, which I'm sure that if you if there are further studies conducted on that, what you'd probably find is what the catalyst for that is really just increased blood circulation before strength training. Yeah, really. Why you do which can, fairly active yeah. exactly, yeah. which can be done in many different ways. Yeah. So, and, and then also it's important to note that they're talking very specifically about muscular hypertrophy, not the development of muscle strength. Yeah, which is, yeah, you train very differently for it. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. anyway. Awesome, well look, thanks so much for everybody uh, for tuning in and, uh, and listening. And if you want to connect with Phil, Phil can be found on Instagram at ADPT Physio, and you can book in for an in person session with him or an online session with Phil at ADPT.physio. So that's not ADPTphysio.com, it is ADPT.physio. Thanks so much for uh, coming on the show, Phil. It's always a pleasure having you on here with us. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking about it. Cheers. Yeah, good, good topic. And we'll see you all for the next episode of the Sound of Movement podcast.